speak to the congregation and anyone else who might be listening on this Wednesday evening. Some some years ago, of course, when I was a young man, I spoke on the topic of the uh, wrath of God based on Colossians, the third chapter, verses one through eight. And that uh, reads, if then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting on, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. <clears throat> Therefore, put to death uh, your members, which are, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covenants, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. <clears throat> now, uh, one of the things I addressed in that uh, uh, speech was, among other things, was a moral decline of this nation. And I think you all recognize that, you know, the words that I spoke then are just as true today, maybe even worse. But tonight I want to speak to you again about the wrath of God, but based on a, a different verse uh, selection, namely Job, the 36th chapter, verse 18. And it reads there, because there is wrath, beware lest he take you away with one blow. For a large ransom would not help you avoid it. Of course, that's the new King James, but King James has it this way, because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke, then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. So I, if I may be uh, permitted uh, uh, to paraphrase, I would say that I, would, I like this phraseology better, because there is wrath, Beware lest he take you away with one blow, then a great ransom cannot redeem you. <clears throat> now, this is one of the uh, traffic control signs, if you will, which God has placed along the center's pathway to uh, perdition. At every turn of the broad way leading to the wide gate, we are given warnings of the destruction which lies ahead. The lessons that are taught by faithful Bible class teachers, uh, the prayers of godly parents, the sermons of faithful gospel preachers, gospel tracts, that is it's available all if you're interested, uh, the warnings of conscience, the innate fear of death, the declarations of holy writ, are just a few of the many obstacle, obstacles God places in the way of the sinner headed to the lake of fire. Wrath is a reality. One chief reason why God wrote the Bible was to warn the sinner of the awful consequences of sin and to bid him flee from the wrath to come. The Bible is replete with warnings about the wrath to come. Now our text is one of these warnings. Now there are many other warnings that uh, imply wrath but do not use the word and I'll just mention a few of them. But if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers, the 32nd chapter, verse 23. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, Hebrews 9, chapter, verse 27. And unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 5, the latter part of that. Verse 5. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's the first part of Hebrews, second chapter, verse 3. But uh, what exactly is wrath? You know, we're not concerned here with man's wrath, uh, which 
often manifest itself in anger, but we're concerned about God's wrath. <clears throat> so I took a quotation from Nelson's dictionary. And he defines it uh, this way. It is the personal manifestation of God's holy moral character and judgment against sin. God's wrath is neither an impersonal process, nor is it irrational and fitful like anger. It is in no way vindictive or malicious. It is holy indignation, God's anger directed against sin. God's wrath is an expression of his holy love. If God is not a God of wrath, his love is no more than frail, worthless sentimentality. The concept of mercy is meaningless, and the cross was a cruel and unnecessary experience for his son. The Bible declares that all people are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2, chapter verse 3. And that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Romans 1st chapter verse 18. Since Christians have been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans the 5th chapter verse 9. The magnitude of God's love is manifested in the cross where God's only son experienced wrath on our behalf the day of the lord the day of the lord's wrath zephaniah first chapter verse 18 that's identical with the great day of the lord zephaniah first chapter verse 14 these terms refer to the wrath of the lamb revelation 6 16 uh, that is jesus christ and that will fall on the ungodly at his second coming. First Thessalonians, the first chapter, verse 10. Fifth chapter, verse 9. Second Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. And let's get back to our opening text from Job. Job. Uh, it may be naturally divided into three headings, which will be treated in sequence. The first is a terrible fact because there is wrath. Now, the reference here is to God wrath as defined by Nelson that we just went through. So let us contemplate four things regarding the wrath of God. Well, there's the fact of God's wrath. A man, uh, that is, those who maintain some semblance of belief in God and his son, they try to forget that there is such a thing as divine wrath. The realization of it makes them uneasy, so they endeavor to banish all thought of it. At times, they are terrified at the bare mention of God's wrath, hence their anxiety to dismiss the subject from their minds. Others try to believe that there is no such thing as God's wrath. They argue that God is loving and merciful, and therefore God's anger is merely a fabrication to compel compliance with uh, whatever behavior is being enjoined or doctrine being advocated. But how do we know that, that God is loving and merciful? Uh, the heathens do not believe that he is, nor does nature clearly and uniformly reveal that fact. It only reveals that a designer was behind the material world. The answer is, we know God to be such because his word so affirms. Yes, and the same Bible which tells of God's mercy speaks of his wrath. And as a matter of fact, refers more frequently to his wrath than it does to his love. So we should pay attention to it. The fact of God's wrath is clearly revealed in the scriptures. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3rd chapter verse 36. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who express the truth in, in unrighteousness. Romans, the first chapter, verse 18. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5, verse 6. In these and in other passages too numerous to mention, the fact of the divine wrath is affirmed. So now let us consider the uh, necessity for God's wrath. Wrath is one of those uh, divine perfections. If God did not <clears throat> punish evildoers, he would be a party to evil doing. He would compromise with wickedness. He would condone sin. Sin demands a penalty. Of necessity, God is a God of wrath. Consider an argument from the last to the greater. In the human sphere, he who loves purity and chastity and has no wrath against impurity and unchastity is a moral leper. He who pities the poor and defenseless and has no wrath against the oppressor who crushes the weak and slays the defenseless, but loves them too, is a fiend. Divine wrath is divine holiness in action. Because God is holy, he hates sin. And because he hates sin, his anger burns against the sinner. As it is written, the boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. The fifth Psalm, verse 5. And again, <clears throat> God is a just judge. And God is angry with the wicked every day. That's uh, from the seventh Psalm, verse 11. Now let's consider the uh, <clears throat> manifestation of God's wrath. God's wrath is not a, an abstract quality. God's wrath is not something that is inactive and inoperative. During Old Testament times, God's wrath was openly displayed against evildoers, notably at the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone from heaven, on the Egyptians and their king when he visited their land with plagues, slew their firstborn and destroyed their armies at the Red Sea and in his dealings with the nation of Israel, in selling them into the hands of their enemies, sending them into captivity, and destroying their beloved city. God's wrath against sin was publicly manifested at the cross, upon which the Savior died in our place for our sins. It was said of old that I have been afflicted and ready to die for my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. <clears throat> Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. That's from 88 Psalm verses 15 and 16. So that was his solemn cry. <clears throat> and now let's consider the greatness of God's wrath. Human wrath is oftentimes a, an awful thing. Uh, scriptures likens the wrath of a king to the, lore, the roaring of a lion, Proverbs 19, verse 12. <clears throat> when a man's anger gets the better of him and he allows his fury to burst all restraints, it is a, it is a fearful thing to behold. Scripture also speaks of the, of the devil having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time, Revelation 12, verse 12. But what, we, what uh, shall be said of the wrath of God? Uh, to what shall we liken it? With what shall we compare the wrath of him who made the heavens and the earth by the word of his power, who spoke and it was done, who commanded and stood fast? Uh, Genesis 1. What must the wrath of him be like who shakes the earth out of its place and makes the pillars thereof to tremble, Job 9, chapter verse 6. What must the wrath of him be like who rebukes the sea and makes it dry, Isaiah the 
50th chapter, verse 2. Who removes the mountains out of their places and overturns, or overturns them in his anger. Job 9, verse 5. What must the wrath of him be like whose majesty is so terrible that no fallen man can live in the sight of him and in whose presence the very seraphim veil their faces? Isaiah 6, chapter verse 2. How indescribably awful must be the unrestrained wrath of such a being. Scripture speaks of God's wrath becoming hot, Exodus uh, 22nd chapter verse 24. It declares, Great is the wrath of the Lord, 2 Kings 22 verse 13. It makes mention of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, Revelations. 19 verse 15. It refers to God's wrath coming upon sinners to the uttermost. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 16. Everything about God is uh, unique. His power is omnipotent. His uh, wisdom is deeper than the ocean. His love is unsearchable. His grace is unfathomable. His holiness is unapproachable. And like his all other perfections and attributes, God's wrath is incomparable, incomprehensible, infinite. God's wrath is the wrath of the Almighty. And what will the wrath of the Almighty be like when it comes upon sinners to the uttermost? Unspeakable. And what power of resistance will poor, frail creatures of the dust have for enduring the full weight of it. None. None whatsoever. It will overwhelm them. It would it will utterly consume them. It will crush them. It will sink them into the lowest depths of hopeless despair. It will be intolerable and unbearable. And yet it will have to be endured, consciously endured for all eternity. These unspeakably solemn thoughts should prepare the unsaved for the next division of our text. That is a solemn warning. In view of this terrible fact, because there is wrath, beware lest he take you away with one blow. Sinners are even now threatened with God's wrath. They are by nature children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 3, we mentioned before. It is true that the long suffering of God delays his wrath, allowing time for repentance. It is true that the time for the full and final and open manifestation of it has not yet arrived. It is true now and has always been so that sinners defy God with apparent impunity. And because of this, the wickedness of the wicked spread themselves like the breaking of the morning sun. Yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire, desire the knowledge of you, of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? Job, the 21st chapter, verses 14 and 15. To let all heed the divine warning, because there is wrath, Beware lest he take you away with one blow. To the sinner we say, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse seven. We read in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verses 29 through 35. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this that they should consider their latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is a poisoning of serpents and a cruel venom of cobras. 
Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. Now the sinner is treading a path uh, more slippery than ice, and unless he forsakes it in due time, his foot shall slip. The bow of God's wrath is already bent. The air of his vengeance is even now fitted to the string, and nothing but his infinite forbearance stays its release. To the impenitent sinner, we must say that only that the only reason you have not already been cast in the lake of fire is because it has been the good pleasure of the Most High to stay your doom. Flee then from the wrath to come while there is yet time. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same thing that you will escape the judgment of God? Romans second chapter, verse three. Did Adam escape the judgment of God? Did Cain? Did Pharaoh? Did Achan? Did Haman? The only reason God has not taken you away with one, one blow before now is because he endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. <clears throat> the time of the sinner's opportunity for fleeing from God's wrath is exceedingly brief and limited. It is sad and tragic that so few realize this. The sinner sees little cause for alarm and fails to apprehend, apprehend his imperative need of promptly accepting Christ as a savior and rendering obedience to the gospel. He imagines himself secure if he considers such things at all, which he rarely does. <clears throat> He goes on in his sin, and because judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, he increases in his boldness against God. But God's ways are different than ours. There is no need for God to be in a hurry. All eternity is at his disposal. When a crime is committed, we demand immediate justice. We lament that a murderer escapes arrest and punishment until the end of his natural life, <clears throat> which we deem to be little to no justice. <clears throat> but it is different with God. He is in no haste to execute uh, judgment because he knows the sinner cannot escape him. It is impossible to flee out of this hall of justice. In due time, every transgression and disobedience receive its just rewards. I will repay them, repay them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Jeremiah the 25th chapter verse 14. Because there's wrath, beware lest he take you away with one blow. The immediate reference is to death, the removal of the sinner from this earth to suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Scripture furnishes many solemn examples of God's blow suddenly cutting off sinners out of the land of the living. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. First two verses of Leviticus chapter 10. Also, we read uh, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines my drink from them, Daniel 5th chapter verses 1 and 2. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the, the wall of the king's palace. 
And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote Daniel uh, 5th chapter verse 5. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, Daniel 5th chapter verse 27. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, Daniel 5th chapter verse 30. The impenitent sinner may enjoy the health and strength of youth, yet he cannot know how soon the dread summons shall come. This night your soul will be required of you, Luke 12th chapter verse 20. So let's turn now to the last cause of our, our clause of our text, uh, which we make mention of here, an utter impossibility. Every member of Adam's race richly deserves God's wrath. Our sins which have mounted up to heaven, our profitless lives spent in selfish gratification with no regard for God's glory, our indifference and carelessness respecting our soul's future welfare, our repeated refusals to respond to the invitation of, of God's grace, all cry aloud for judgment to descend upon us. But God's merciful provisions has provided a ransom that, that's a covering for, for uh, sin. And that ransom is Christ. <clears throat> Our text speaks of this ransom as great or large in the New King James Version. It's great in its value, great in its scope, great in its effectiveness, great because it del delivers us from so great a death and secures so great a salvation. But great as this ransom is, it avails nothing for those who ignore and reject it. Because there is wrath, beware lest you take, uh, he take you away with one blow, for a large ransom would not help you avoid it. If this ransom is despised, then there is no possible escape for the sinner. If Christ our ransom is rejected, there remains nothing else but wrath. So how this text shatters the fiction of salvation without obedience. Had repudiates, repudiates any possibility of a second chance in the next world. How effectively it closes the door of hope against all who die in their sins. When the blow of God removes such a one from this world, then uh, a large ransom would not help you avoid it. There are other scriptures equally explicit. He who is often rebuked and hardened his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy, Proverbs 29th chapter, verse 1. For the impenitent sinner, there is no remedy, no deliverance, no hope beyond the grave. For a large ransom will not help you avoid it. Why is that? Because it is appointed and the man wants to die. And after that, not a second chance, not a further probation, but the judgment. Why? Because at death, the sinner goes immediately to torments, as did the rich man, Luke 16, chapter verses 22 and 23. And in that place, there is no preaching the gospel and no opportunity to respond to his call if it were. Why? Because in that place there awaits for all nothing but the resurrection of condemnation, John the fifth chapter, verse 29, and the judgment of the great white throne, Revelation 20th chapter, verse 11. For a large ransom will not help you avoid it. Why? Because repentance and further acts of obedience that then will be too late. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, verse 18. For a large ransom will not help you avoid it. Why? Because anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire, Revelations 
20 of chapter verse 15. And this lake has no outlet. Here then is a solemn warning against indifference because there's wrath. Here is a solemn warning against procrastination because lest he take you away with one blow. Here's a solemn warning against hoping in another chance after death for a large ransom would not help you avoid it. Here's a powerful plea for obeying Christ now. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We shall not. There will be no escape. Then seek the Lord in the hope that he may be found, though he is not far from each one of us. Acts 17, chapter verse 27. Answer the great summons of the gospel, 2 Thessalonians, 2nd chapter verse 14. And obey from the heart that form of doctrine, Romans 6, verse 17, delivered once for all time to the saints, Jude 3. Be diligent to make your call and election sure, 2 Peter uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. So that concludes my remarks. I hope that has been very helpful to you in understanding a, a very uh, important word used by uh, God Almighty.